Hello everybody and welcome to one more lecture on compressible flows. Today we're going to talk about weak shocks. In the last video, we derived the equations for a flow presenting an oblique shock. We saw that to obtain the expressions for an oblique shock, we had to replace m1 by m1 sinus beta in the 1D equations. Thus, the changes across an oblique shock are a function of the upstream Mach number m1 in the shock angle beta. The normal shock is a special case where beta equals 90 degrees. We also derived an expression relating theta, beta and the upstream Mach number, and we saw that a diagram could be built. Note that to have a shock, the normal upstream Mach number, m1 sinus beta, must be greater than 1, which means that beta is greater than arc sinus 1 over m1. But we saw in the third lecture that arc sinus 1 over m1 equals the Mach angle alpha. We seek to establish a relation between theta, beta and m1 in the case of an extremely weak shock, with theta very small and beta approaching alpha. Let's consider the following general equation. In the case of a weak shock, a shock through which small variations of the flow properties occur, theta is small and using Taylor's theorem for n equals 1, we obtain the following expression, where h o t are the higher order terms. After some manipulations, we obtain the following equation. Knowing that beta is very close to the Mach angle, we can write that tangent beta times theta equals tangent alpha times theta. It is also known that tangent alpha equals 1 over the square root of m1 square minus 1. Substituting the previous equation, we obtain the final expression. We will now use the previous equation to establish valid jump relations in the case of a weak shock. If we take the equation relating the ratio of static pressures before and after the shock, the following expression arises. To calculate the normal speed jump, we proceed similarly by exploiting the fact that theta is small to obtain a simple linear relation in theta. We are also interested in the variation of the velocity norm, w. We can establish the following equation. The demonstration I'm gonna leave to you guys, but you have to use again Taylor's theorem. We considered in the last lecture the case of a wedge that compresses the flow, adiabatically but not isentropically. If we replace this corner by a succession of segments slightly inclined by an angle delta theta with respect to each other, we observe the formation of a weak shock with small variations of pressure and speed. If we now push the reasoning to its infinitesimal limit by making delta theta tend to zero, the regions of uniform flow are reduced to Mach lines on which the properties of the flow are constant. In this case, the compression process is isentropic. The transition to the limit delta theta towards zero is reflected in the speed variation by the following differential expression. In these formulas, m denotes the local Mach number upstream of the Mach line considered and d theta the infinitesimal deflection through this Mach line. The final result is illustrated in this image. As the turn progresses, the Mach number is decreasing and thus the Mach waves are at ever increasing angles. The Mach waves coalesce to form an oblique shock inclined at the proper angle, corresponding to the initial Mach number and the overall deflection angle theta t. In the case of a smooth concave wall, we have a prandt meyer compression. In the case of a smooth convex wall, or at a sharp convex turn, we have prandt meyer expansions. Our objective now is to relate the changes in Mach number to the turning angle in a prandt meyer flow. Across each Mach wave, there is an infinitesimal variation of flow quantities, very small increase of the velocity and very small decrease of the pressure, for example. The final state results from the superposition of these infinitesimal variations related to each Mach wave. The previous relations also applies in the case of an isentropic expansion 
as long as we adopt the adequate sign convention. If we count theta positively in the case of a convex corner, we will have an infinitesimal increase of the velocity w linked to an elementary deflection dt by the following relation. To treat the case of a finite angle theta, we have to integrate the following relation. To do so, we need to express dw over w as a function of dm and m. We can establish the following relation. We denote nu m the Prandtl-Meyer function by integrating the above relationship between state 1 and state 2, we obtain nu m2 equals theta plus nu m1. The Prandtl-Meyer function can be calculated in advance and tabulated. The following procedure needs to be followed to discover m2. Knowing m1, we find nu m1 in the table. Knowing the angle theta, we can calculate nu m2. Knowing nu m2, we deduce m2 by reverse reading of the table. Remember that if we know the final Mach number, we can use the isentropic equations in table to compute the final thermodynamic state for any given set of initial conditions. Let's try an exercise now to see if you understood. The wall in the figure turns an angle of 12 degrees with a sharp corner. The fluid which is initially at m1 equals 2.06, must follow the wall, executing a Prandtl-Meyer expansion at the corner. Determine the final Mach number m2. The solution is very simple. We know from the table that nu m1 equals 28 degrees. So nu m2 equals 40 degrees. From the table, we obtain that m2 equals 2.54. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to visit my website for more videos and exercises. See you in the next lecture.